One of the more interesting types of substances in the real world is liquids or fluids. And they're very important to how our bodies work, how we uh, eat or drink, and lots of um, industrial and uh, chemical practices that create or process the things that we use on a daily basis. Um, so we'll find that we can use the basic principles of physics to get an understanding of how fluids work and make some quantitative predictions. It's all going to begin, though, with a definition of a concept called fluid pressure. So a key observation about fluids is that it's possible for them to exert a force on surfaces that are immersed in the fluid. We imagine a ideal surface of some area A uh, in contact with a fluid on one side. And that fluid can exert a force, and we find that that force is proportional to the area of the surface and also proportional to a property of the fluid that we call its pressure. So a way of measuring the pressure exerted by a fluid is to take the uh, force caused by the fluid and divide it by the surface area of the surface it's pushing on. So the units of pressure in SI are newtons per meters squared. And this is called a Pascal. The abbreviation is PA. So if we have an ordinary object with, uh, you know, some left side, right side, top side, bottom side, whatever, and it's immersed in the fluid, then that fluid can cause forces on that object. Now let's uh, be sufficiently general here, and let's say that there's a, a certain value of pressure to the left, a value of pressure to the right, a value of pressure on the top, and a value of pressure on the bottom. And the way that pressure works is it always pushes the surface away from the fluid. So these four pressures are going to cause uh, forces on this box, and they're going to push in different directions. In the x direction, we would get a force from PL pushing towards the right. Because it's on the left surface, the interior of the box is in the middle, and the fluid is on the outside. So it pushes it away from the fluid, which is to the right. So we'll get a plus I hat force. Uh, so this is x components. So we'll get a positive force due to PL. And that will depend on the area of this side, AL. We'll also get a force from the right side, and this force will push the box to the left. In the y direction, we get a similar thing happening. The pressure on the top pushes the box down, and the pressure on the bottom pushes the box up. Now that some of these forces if these are the only forces acting, the sum of these forces, of course, determines the acceleration or the motion of this object in the fluid. And so what we see here is, since we're considering a rectangle, the area of the top surface and the area of the bottom surface are equal. So we can just call this one also AT, and over here also AT. And the area of the left surface and the right surface are also equal. So we can call this one AL as well, and over here AL. OK, so the conclusion we get from this is uh, the pressure on the left and the pressure on the right, if those two are uh, equal, then they balance each other out and it results in no acceleration. Uh, same thing with the pressure at the top with the minus sign there and the pressure at the bottom. So if an object is immersed in a fluid that has an equal pressure everywhere, then it won't feel any net force due to that fluid and it won't accelerate. And this is the situation that most things seem to be in. We're all immersed in air all the time and the air has some pressure, but it doesn't result in a net force one way or the other 
in most situations. However, if there is a pressure difference between one side versus the other, then the object may feel a net force. For example, if you're a, um, a very lightweight thing like a balloon can detect pressure differences in the uh, air around it and feel a net force upwards. Or something, uh, you know, underwater might have a difference in pressure from one side to the other and get kind of sucked along with the water. Uh, so this means that we can't detect any uh, differences. Uh, we can't detect actually, well, we can't detect what the actual values of pressure are. We can only detect that something is happening when the pressure is different between two places. So we don't, um, just from the definition of pressure, we don't have a way of measuring uh, the absolute value of the pressure um, unless we could somehow eliminate all fluid from one side then we would uh, have a zero force on that side um, but that's not um, right right now is not seeming to be possible so so we can only detect a difference in pressure and uh, one way to write these uh, equations out then is something like max equals uh, the difference in pressure in the x direction times the area of the uh, left or right sides and the acceleration in the y direction is proportional to the difference in pressure vertically times the area of the top and bottom side. So this is true for a, uh, a rectangle immersed in the fluid where the pressure might be different on the four sides. So that's our definition of pressure. And an important application of pressurized fluids can immediately be uh, discovered if we add in one thing called Pascal's principle. So Pascal's principle is an observation about the behavior of essentially liquids uh, that have um, basically, the liquid has to have a high speed of sound, but we're not going to go into that now. Um, and Pascal's principle says that uh, changes in the pressure of a fluid are immediately distributed throughout the fluid. Uniformly. Okay, so what that means is if you have some uh, tank of fluid, imagine a swimming pool, and you have two different locations in that swimming pool called A and B, right? And pressure, uh, at point A, the fluid has some pressure. We don't know what it is. We just call it PA. And at point B, the fluid has some pressure. What Pascal's principle means is that if you somehow increased the pressure at location A, if you did some process that increased the pressure at location A, then the pressure at location B would immediately uh, increase uh, by the same amount. So we don't know what the actual pressures might be, but we know that they'll increase by the same amount or decrease by the same amount. And the way that Pascal uh, knew that this was a good principle is he had kind of a neat uh, set of glassware here. I'll just try to draw a version of it here. You can probably look up a better picture than what I can draw, but this was a set of uh, vases that were all connected on the bottom, and they're called Pascal's vases. And even though the vases uh, or test tubes or whatever can have wildly different shapes, uh, if any fluid, if any water basically is added to one of the openings at the top, all of the other um, levels of water move up or down in unison. So it doesn't matter what shape the water is, uh, what shape the fluid is, how weird of a container it's in, um, changing the pressure at one point will immediately change the pressure at all other points. So the application uh, that I was alluding to here is 
the application of hydraulics. So the idea behind hydraulics is to exploit this property of fluids to maintain an even distribution of pressure and to set up some uh, containers of fluid that have movable pistons in them, sealed movable pistons, uh, to exploit this constancy of pressure. So here we've drawn a basic example of how a hydraulic system would work. We've got one connected area of fluid, uh, two pistons here drawn as discs in perspective. Uh, these can move up or down. And so let's say that, uh, let's, let's define a variable delta x1 for the piston on the left to, to move down would we'll give us a positive value of delta x1. And then to move uh, up on the right would give us a, uh, a value of delta x2 uh, in piston 2. Right, so the, the main feature of these pistons that makes them different is, uh, I've tried to draw this uh, to scale here, is that they may have different cross-sectional areas, A1 and A2. And so their relationship for force to pressure is different. All right, uh, force 1 is equal to uh, pressure times area one, and force two in magnitude is equal to the pressure times area two. So what Pascal's principle has to say about this is if we apply a force to piston one that changes the pressure, then that is immediately going to move over here and it's going to cause a change in pressure over here and cause a force on piston two. And those forces will be related by the fact that they have equal pressures. So the fact of equal pressures here gives us uh, some uh, useful results. So if I solve both of these equations for pressure and then equate the pressure to each other, I could say that F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2. So there's a common ratio here. The forces are not equal. Uh, in fact, we can see that the piston with a larger area will be producing more force. So this almost acts like a simple machine with the ability to multiply force or uh, reduce force by having different areas. It's like a fluid lever, essentially. Uh, we could even write this out uh, as a formula for F2. F2 would be equal to uh, the fraction A2 over A1 multiplied by F1. And if you look at this factor right here, this uh, factor in parentheses, this fraction is telling us how much uh, the input force F1 gets multiplied uh, when it creates an output force F2. So this uh, factor here, this ratio of areas, is almost like a mechanical advantage of the hydraulic system. In fact, that brings up some questions. If we're able to multiply force like this, what about conservation of energy. What about the principle of simple machines? Work in equals work out. How do we get uh, how do we get that to still be true? Well, let's take a look at the motion of these pistons. Remember, the work done is equal to the force times the distance. So for piston one, the uh, piston moves down while the force is up. So we have a negative F1 times delta X1. For piston 2, the piston moves up by delta x2 while the force is pointing up. So the principle of simple machines was that these uh, work inputs and work outputs have the same magnitude. Uh, and we've actually got the correct sign here, so these two work values must add up to zero. So what we get is F1 delta x1 has to equal F2 delta x2 when the forces are both up and the delta x's are defined down for piston 1 and up for piston 2. OK, so that looks, um, that looks just like the general formula for a simple machine. How does this spe specifically apply to the hydraulics? Well, it has to do with the delta x's and the fact that it's a piston. So let's imagine that there's some 
amount of volume of the fluid that moves from the left side to the right side when piston one is pushed down. We'll call that delta V, all right? So delta X times A1 is equal to delta V uh, with a, yeah, that's right, no minus sign there because delta X is a downwards push and A1 is that cross-sectional area. So we're talking about a volume like there that moves down and goes through that pipe. Uh, for the right side, we have delta X2 equals A2. Uh, sorry, delta X2 times A2 equals delta V. So if we plug these two things in together, we get F1 times delta V over A1 equals F2 times delta V over A2. And wouldn't you know, F1 over A1 is the pressure, and F2 over A2 is the pressure on the other side. So they're both the same pressures, and they're both the same changes in volume. So we see that this uh, motion of the pistons and the motion of the fluid uh, does obey the principle of simple machines, work in equals work out. And also, we get to find out that the work done by one side of the piston is equal to pressure times the change in volume, or the, the flow of volume. Right, so, so the hydraulic system basically acts like a simple lever, uh, multiplying force, it's a simple machine. The big advantage of hydraulics and why you see them in so many, um, you know, excavators and construction equipment, is this uh, linkage here between the two cylinders uh, is actually very flexible. It doesn't need to have, uh, you know, a rigid, solid, pipe going between these two. This can be a hose which can bend and flex in any direction. As long as it can withstand the pressure, uh, then it can go wherever it needs to go. So you can have like movable arms and stuff where this hose bends with them and the pistons um, can be placed where they need to go. All right. Uh, so that's the principle of hydraulics. Uh, we're not going to go and study how to build, uh, you know, an excavator arm or anything. Um, but uh, this is the basic principle behind how a hydraulic system can multiply force um, by having two pistons of different size. Okay, so that's a very important application. Uh, now let's move on in terms of uh, physics principles to a situation called hydrostatic equilibrium. So the, most of the liquids we see in, uh, you know, in everyday use are in hydrostatic equilibrium. A glass of water or coffee just sitting there on the table, uh, you know, if it, as long as it's not churning and bubbling or recently stirred, it's in all likelihood in hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, the the uh, exact definition of this term is that any parcel of the fluid, any, any piece of the fluid is at... Uh, mechanical equilibrium, so not accelerating and not moving. So let's write that out. I call these parcels. So every parcel, uh, every parcel of fluid is at mechanical equilibrium. So that means that uh, the net force on that bit of fluid is equal to zero. Okay, so let's just uh, consider what this would mean uh, for a fluid that uh, for a fluid that has no other forces on it, only the forces of its own pressure. Okay, so uh, here's a parcel of fluid, and I'll, I'll put it with dotted lines because there's not like an extra object here. It's just a certain region of the fluid, and uh, 
it's only feeling forces from its own pressure. So what does that mean? We'll have a pressure on the left, a pressure on the right, a pressure on the top, and a pressure on the bottom. And we know from our um, discussions a few minutes ago that if these pressures are all equal, then there is no net force. So in this situation, the uh, condition of hydrostatic equilibrium means that we have a constant pressure. Okay, so that's kind of a baseline understanding of how pressure behaves in the system. If there's no uh, force, uh, external forces one way or the other, if it's just the fluid by itself, then it will uh, end up at a constant pressure. But this only really applies to maybe a, a kind of bizarre situation of a, uh, a fluid in uh, like a uh, space station or in a space shuttle or uh, in free fall where it has no gravitational force on it. Largely, the fluids we deal with in everyday experience have this gravitational force acting on them because they're near the surface of the Earth. And so this isn't uh, really, it's, it's a good baseline, but it's not very applicable to, you know, a glass of water sitting on a table or a swimming pool or an ocean or something like that. So let's uh, roll ourselves back a little bit. Say this is, this is too simplified to give us a realistic prediction. Let's say there is only... Uh, self-pressure and gravity. All right, so in that case, we're going to have to uh, incorporate the gravitational force by knowing how much mass of fluid is enclosed in this parcel. Uh, so now what we get, sum of forces in the x direction is still going to be uh, PL minus PR times the area of the left and right faces. Uh, that will be equal to zero for equilibrium horizontally. Uh, but then in the vertical direction, we have an additional force uh, to consider the force of gravity. So we'll have PB pushing up, P, uh, PT pushing down, uh, and the area of the top and bottom face. And then we'll also have a downward force due to the force of gravity. Okay, so that's the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium here. Left and right pressures are the same, so horizontally there's no change in pressure if you go along a horizontal line. Uh, but vertically, there's a difference between the pressure at the top and bottom of a parcel that depends on how much mass is in there. Now this is in a little bit of an awkward format right now because it depends on the specific dimensions of this parcel. How much mass is in there? What is its area? It would be better to just be able to talk about the fluid itself locally than have to define an imaginary box every time. So let's see if we can work on this a little bit. Uh, what I'm going to do is divide both sides of this equation by the volume of the box. So PB minus uh, PT. Uh, actually, no, I don't want to divide by the volume. Let's divide by the area of the top and bottom face. Yeah. Okay, so the area of the top and bottom face divided on both sides. Okay, so that doesn't seem to do much right away. Uh, we do end up with a left side that's only a difference in pressure. On the right side, we'll make one realization here, and that is about the mass of the fluid in this parcel. The mass of this is equal to the density of the fluid, rho f, kilograms per cubic meter, uh, times the volume of the parcel. And the volume of this parcel is dependent on its dimensions. We can assume with generality that it's a, a rectangular prism. Uh, so the volume is length times width times height. So eight area of the top and bottom face is 
uh, length times width, and the height we'll just write as an h variable. Okay, and the reason for doing this is then this area uh, can be uh, eliminated on this equation here. So it will be density of the fluid times the acceleration of gravity times the height of the parcel. Okay, so this, is, this gives us a pretty clear picture of how the pressure will vary from the top uh, to the bottom of the parcel. The bottom will be higher than the top in pressure by a factor of the density of fluid times the gravitational acceleration times the height of the parcel. Uh, so that still is, it, that's a little bit simpler. We, we have no dependence on the area of the parcel. It could be any size left or right, uh, but we still have this dependence on the height. Uh, and we can, we can release ourselves from having this specific parcel height by realizing that the difference in pressure between two heights the difference in pressure is proportional to the difference in depth. So uh, delta P vertically is equal to rho of the fluid, density of the fluid, times the gravitational acceleration times the difference in depth. Okay, and this, this would apply then to any parcel no matter how big it is, even a parcel that started at the top and went all the way to the bottom, or a really narrow parcel somewhere in the middle, it would work for anyone. So we generally take this and write it as a formula for the pressure at a given depth in the fluid. So we take our parcel to be starting at the surface. So our P of the top is P at the surface. We go down a depth H into the fluid and the pressure at that point is P of H. So this is P of the surface plus density of fluid times G times H. All right, so in hydrostatic equilibrium, under the influence of a gravitational field, the pressure in a fluid starts at some constant value for its surface and then increases uniformly with depth at a rate equal to the density of the fluid times the gravitational acceleration. Okay, so a more dense fluid has its pressure go up quicker, and uh, the gravitational acceleration here does play a role. As we saw in the first uh, case of no gravity, G would be zero and the pressure would be equal everywhere to the pressure at the surface. So this makes us uh, able to calculate some kind of fun questions. Uh, these may be important to you if you're going to design submarines or something or go scuba diving. Uh, let's, let's do a guess here of an example that we might see. Let's say we have a lake that is uh, 406 meters deep. And if we go all the way to the bottom of this lake, what is the pressure? Okay, so the pressure at a depth of 406 meters would be equal to the pressure at the surface. Uh, and a lake, I assume, is made out of water. The density of water is one kilogram per liter, or 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. That's uh, the original definition of the kilogram, by the way, is one liter of water. Uh, so there's the density uh, factor. Acceleration of gravity is 9.8. And the depth is 406 meters. Okay. So the pressure at the surface is the only thing unknown here. We're going to cheat a little bit. We don't technically know this value yet from experimental evidence, but we'll plug it in for now, treat it as a, a value from the front of the book table or something. The value of the pressure at uh, the surface 
is uh, 101325. So I'll write that up here. 101325 Pascals. You may have uh, seen this number before as the standard pressure of the atmosphere of Earth. And that is, that is what it is. So I'm assuming that the surface of this lake is, uh, you know, on Earth. Uh, so if we plug in these numbers and put them together, we'll get a pressure that is 40, uh, 4,080,125 uh, pascals. Uh, if you express this in terms of atmospheres, it's about 40.27 atmospheres. So, so quite a considerable increase in pressure compared to the one atmosphere at the surface, where 40 times more pressure at the bottom of this lake. And, you know, 400 meters is deep for a lake, but it's not very far, like, to run, right? 400 meters is once around a track or maybe half a block in a big city. So it's not, a, it's not a really long distance, but as you go down, this pressure goes up and it becomes quite difficult to reach those kind of depths without doing something special like building a submarine that's strong or putting yourself in a uh, diving suit. Okay, so that's one uh, application of hydrostatic equilibrium, knowing how pressure varies with depth. A second important application from a scientific perspective is to use this property of fluids to allow us to measure pressure by measuring distances. The basic device that does this is called a manometer. Let me draw a diagram of what a manometer looks like. So you have some glassware that's bent into a U-shape, and you put the bend at the bottom, and you somehow fill this with some type of liquid. So there's a density here, a fluid that you know its density, usually water, <coughs> but it could be mercury or some other kind of oil that's more stable. Uh, and you fill the bottom of this tube with that fluid, and you have two valves allowing you to pressurize either side of this glassware. We'll call P0 the pressure on the left in the, in the non-fluid region, and P1 the pressure on the right. All right. On the left side, we'll measure the height of the fluid column from some reference point at the bottom we'll see that it doesn't actually matter where this reference point is because of Pascal's principle. Uh, and we'll measure the height at the top of the right column and call that H1. So there is a delta H of height difference between the two sides of the manometer. Uh, so how can we analyze this based on our uh, knowledge of fluids in gravity. Uh, well, we can look at uh, every every time we have a surface, we can look at that surface and extend that pressure down to a uh, a certain depth. Uh, so we so so we could take you know this p zero and uh, go down one centimeter deeper into that fluid and know the pressure there. Uh, we could go two centimeters deeper in the fluid and we could know the pressure there as well. Uh, so, so most of those are not really, they're true, but they're not really useful in deducing anything about the manometer. But if we take this surface and go down a depth that puts us at this reference level, then we can call this pressure down here, say P at the bottom, uh, and we'll get that pressure uh, from starting at P0 and going down. But if we also start at P1 on the right side and go down, we'll get the same pressure at the same location because the fluid is, you know, it's only one fluid. It only has one pressure at each spot. <coughs> so we can set up equations for this fluid in hydrostatic equilibrium where we have P's, P at the bottom uh, is equal to pressure at the left top surface plus 
rho gh0 for the left column, and also Pb is equal to the pressure at the right surface going down a depth h1. Okay, so we have these two expressions which are both true for the pressure at the bottom. And if we uh, set these two pressures equal to each other, because they are both the pressure at the bottom, then we can get uh, P1 minus P0 equals rho G times H1 minus H0. So essentially, the difference in pressure between the two sides is equal to rho G times the difference in height between the two fluid columns. All right, so this enables us to measure pressures then. If we have a known pressure on the left, say atmospheric pressure, this is just open, and then we have a, uh, a sample of gas or some other fluid on the right side that we don't know its pressure, we can solve this for the change in pressure, the difference in pressure between the two sides, just by throwing a ruler up here and measuring the delta H and knowing what fluid it is, knowing its density. Okay, uh, so this, this, uh, this uh, basically settles the manometer. Uh, of course, uh, one last point to point out here is that uh, you know, the side with the lower level of fluid is the side with the higher pressure. If you ever get confused on that, just think about you know, if there's lots of pressure over here, then it's got more force, it's gonna push this side down more. So this doesn't necessarily tell you anything about the directions but the higher pressure one has the lower surface. Okay, a uh, very clever modification of the manometer is called the barometer. And this type of barometer was first invented by the Italian Torricelli. So we call it a Torricelli barometer. It's a barometer based on modifying a manometer. And what's done is the left tube is made very tall. And the right tube is made very short and very flat. All right, the reason that this one is made tall and this one is made flat and wide is so that the, uh, the fluid level over here doesn't change very much, right? Uh, like, a, like a hydraulic piston, it doesn't move very much if this one moves. Uh, and to accentuate the motion of the left, because the surface level on the left is where uh, the measurement will be taken. We'll call that H0. The other thing that's done in this modification is the right side is left open to the atmosphere. So the pressure over here on the right side, which is P1, will be equal to the pressure of the atmosphere. And uh, the crucial modification really is on the left side. This uh, side is capped off uh, with no uh, valves or tubes going anywhere. And when it's first constructed, this side is left completely full of fluid and made tall enough so that the fluid actually gets pulled down somewhat by its own weight. So this uh, side right here has no other fluid in it at all. And its pressure becomes uh, exactly zero. There's no matter in this area at all except for some stray molecules of vapor perhaps. Uh, so this area is actually a, uh, a vacuum develops. If you begin this all full of liquid, say horizontal, and then stand it up, and it pulls away, a vacuum develops there, and it's called a, uh, I think there's two U's in vacuum. Whatever. Uh, you, you know how to spell vacuum, right? Sure you. There. Uh, this is called a Torricellian vacuum. It's one of the first ways ever that uh, humans discovered to make a space totally devoid of matter.
mostly devoid of matter. Uh, so if we apply the ideas of the manometer to this Torricelli barometer, we see that the delta P between the two sides will equal rho of the fluid times G times the delta H. And now since one side is vacuum and the other side is the atmosphere, we, could, we can say that the pressure of the atmosphere is equal to the density of the fluid times the acceleration of gravity times the height of the column on the uh, left side. So the barometer is because it gives us a way to measure the pressure of the atmosphere over here by looking at the height of this column. And you've probably heard of these type of measurements. A specific fluid is specified, say mercury, and the height is measured, say, in millimeters. And so it's, a, it's an equivalent way to measure the pressure of something is to tell uh, millimeters of uh, the mercury fluid. You could also use, uh, say, inches of water if you wanted, or, or uh, meters of oil. But uh, the standard is uh, to use millimeters, uh, since it's a finer grade of measurement, and to use mercury, since the tube doesn't have to be as tall. It's more dense. All right, so let's answer a fun question here. Let's just check if we had an atmosphere on one particular day of 101.325 pascals, and we use mercury as our fluid, which has a density of 13,600 kilograms per cubic meter, how high would our column of mercury stand? Uh, so this is quite simple to solve. Uh, just divide the density and gravity over to the left side, and we get a height of 0 0.7603 meters. All right. So this matches up with our maybe our prior knowledge that one atmosphere of pressure is equivalent in this experiment to a column that is 760 millimeters tall when you use mercury. I might leave it as a challenge to you to find out how tall this tube would need to be if a fluid of water was used instead of mercury. It's tall, but it can be done. Our last application of the statics of fluids is going to be the force that their pressure imparts on other objects that are immersed within them or touching them in some way. This force is called the buoyant force. And to derive its formula, let's imagine repeating the experiment for hydrostatic equilibrium, but now Inside of our parcel, we have a solid or some other object with a different density and a, and a, and a certain volume different, <clears throat> different density from the fluid. In the x direction, the sum forces will be zero, so we'll just kind of ignore that. But in the y direction, we'll now have the force due to the pressure variations vertically of the fluid, and we'll have the force of gravity on the solid object, not on the fluid itself, but now this uh, object is something different, so it has a different mass, m sub s. Now we can do the same uh, trick that we did for hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, divide both sides of this equation by the uh, uh, area of the top and bottom. Uh, but we're not actually going to do that. We're going to use the fact that the rest of the fluid is already in hydrostatic equilibrium. So PB minus PT is equal to rho G delta H, where delta H is the difference between the top and bottom of this object. I know that it's a rectangle, but uh, you can trust me that it works out the same way for any other shape. You know, you can just consider the shape to be uh, a bunch of rectangles glued together or something like that. Uh, so if we use the hydrostatic equilibrium here, on this first term, this is going to turn into the density of the fluid times gravity. Uh, and then we have delta H 
which is the height, multiplied by the area of the top and bottom. So this is actually going to turn into the volume of the solid. So this part right here is what we call the buoyant force. Buoyant force of an immersed object That buoyant force, Fb, is equal to the density of the fluid times the acceleration of gravity times the volume of the solid object. It's often said that this is equal to the weight of fluid displaced. If it's immersed, Vs is equal to the volume of fluid displaced. Vs times the density of the fluid is the mass of fluid displaced and the mass times g is the weight of fluid displaced. So this force always points opposite to the direction of gravity and uh, depends on the volume of the object and the density of the fluid. It doesn't actually depend on the density of the object or the object's mass at all. It's only due to the fluid. Okay, so for immersed objects, a, a frequent question, uh, one of the kind of earliest examples of a scientist answering a question, kind of famous story, uh, the question of Archimedes, and Archimedes' uh, solution to that question called Archimedes' principle, which determines whether an object will float or sink. So let's look at that. Uh, for an object to float, that implies that it's going to start moving upwards. So the acceleration would be greater than zero and that implies that rho of the fluid times g times volume of the solid is greater than the mass of the solid times g. Well, let's work on that a little bit. There's, there's a g on both sides, boom, boom. And uh, if we divide both sides by the volume of the solid, then we get mass over volume for the solid so that's just the same as the density of the solid. Uh, so for the acceleration to be upwards, the density of the fluid must be greater than the density of the solid object. If we want something to uh, sink, then the acceleration should be less than zero. It's going to move down. And we could do the same manipulations on the left side as we did for floating and find out that the density of the fluid in that case would need to be less than the density of the solid. All right, so Archimedes' principle is that objects that are more dense than the fluid sink and objects that are less dense than the fluid float. So it's not merely whether something is heavy or not, it has to be less, uh, less or more dense, which is why we can have enormously massive, you know, battleships and stuff that still actually float because mostly they're filled with air and their average density is still less than the density of water. Okay, so Archimedes' <clears throat> principle um, and the buoyant force have a story around them. And it was based on the way that Archimedes, uh, you know, the, the problem that was posed to him uh, when he came up with this. Uh, there was a king, so the story goes, that had been gifted a crown, and the king wanted to know if the crown was made of pure gold or if it was somewhat uh, cut with some other cheaper metal. And Archimedes was the scientist on the court, and so he was tasked with this scientific question. And he couldn't figure it out for quite some time, uh, but his wife told him to relax and take a bath. And he took the bath, and as he sunk in the bathtub, the, the water level rose up as he went down, and he figured out that he was displacing volume and that that was the key to solving the problem. So he ran through the streets uh, naked from being in the bathtub because he was so excited, screaming, Eureka! Uh, I figured it out, and um, 
uh, some possibly some punishment befell the person who gifted the crown that was not um, not pure gold. So let's uh, try to answer a similar question now. We won't run screaming um, with success when we're done, but we'll we'll know the answer. So let's say a crown weighs 12.0 newtons when in air and weighs 10.5 newtons when immersed in water. And we'll ask what is its density? Uh, with, the, with the second question implied there is if its density is not equal to the density of gold, then it's not made of gold. Uh, at least not made of solid gold. Okay, so what we've got going on here is two parts really to this. We have a weight in air, so the mass of the crown is equal to this 12.0 newtons divided by 9.8 meters per second squared. So, but when it's in air, it's just being weighed uh, for its real mass, and this comes out to 1.224 1 uh, kilograms. So that alone doesn't tell you what it's made of, just its total mass. It also doesn't tell you the volume. For the volume, we'll need to look at this formula for the buoyant force. <clears throat> Now, when the crown is immersed in the water, nothing changes about how gravity pulls on it. Still gets pulled down, but additionally, the buoyant force pulls it up. So the buoyant force pulls it up. The tension from the string attached to the scale also pulls it up, and so the the tension is 10.5 doesn't need to be as big as it was in air because there's this buoyant force helping it. So the buoyant force is actually equal to the difference between these two. Fb would be equal to 1.5 newtons in the upwards direction. All right, so, so there's our uh, key. Our fluid is water. The acceleration of gravity was still uh, 9.8 meters per second squared, even in Archimedes' day. <clears throat> and the unknown uh, remaining in that equation is the volume of the solid object, or the volume of the crown. So if we calculate uh, for the volume here, we will get 1.53 times 10 to the negative 4 cubic meters. And from that, we can calculate the density by just taking mass of the crown divided by its volume All right, and that comes out to very close to 8,000 kilograms per cubic meter. All right, so that's a big density compared to water. But unfortunately for the uh, metal worker who gave us this crown, it is still far too small to be made of gold. Uh, the density of gold is around 19,000 kilograms per cubic meter. All right, so our conclusion here is that this crown uh, with these two measurements of weight, basically those two measurements of weight alone, we can determine that it's not made of Pure gold maybe looks like it's made of uh, brass or bronze or something, maybe with a gold plate. Okay, our, our last uh, <clears throat> situation for buoyant forces is when things are actually floating on a surface. So all of our talking so far has a bit restricted to the case where the object is completely immersed in the fluid and it feels a buoyant force due to being touched on all sides by the same fluid. So if it's, uh, if it's, if the object has a density that's less than the density of the fluid, it will accelerate upwards and it will eventually reach some sort of surface 
usually we think of this as air on top and water below, and it's floating on that surface. Uh, but it doesn't need to be air and water. It could be some oil on the top and some water on the bottom or water over mercury. But if something is floating at a surface, we've got a object here with uh, one density below called rho f and one density above called rho a. And when this happens, there will be a volume some fraction of the volume is below the surface, and some fraction of the volume is above the surface. So VA plus VB equals the total volume of the solid. And in this case, we get a buoyant force from both fluids. From the bottom fluid, we get a buoyant force equal to the weight of that fluid displaced, so VB. And from the top fluid, we get a buoyant force due to its density and the volume of part A that's above the surface. So our equation for motion of the object, sum of forces in the y direction, is both of these buoyant forces Uh, minus the mass of the object, uh, the force of gravity on the object. So minus, I'll write this as rho of the solid times g times v of the solid. And this will be equal to ma. Right, so if we are in a case of uh, floating on the surface, you know, in reality, there might be some uh, bobbing or shaking or, or listing or something. Uh, but overall, if we're in floating equilibrium, then this vertical component of the acceleration is uh, zero. And we have a balance of buoyant forces with the force of gravity. So we get an equation for that that is uh, rho F V B plus rho A VA equals rho S VS. Uh, so the solutions to this are not as simple. The fraction of volume below and the fraction of volume above may depend in a complicated way on the shape or how if maybe it's tilted or something. These volumes, you know, they add up to the total, but the way of getting the fractions based on geometry can be kind of a, a hard 3D geometric problem, right? If you had like a, a cylinder that was at an angle, I don't think most of us recall how to calculate the volume of a cylinder that's cut on, uh, on a diagonal across its midsection, right? So, so the volumes could be hard to, to calculate geometrically, but they do have some value, and uh, equilibrium will exist when it satisfies this equation. <clears throat> uh, one thing that we can do to uh, make some qualitative conclusions here is define a uh, fraction of the volume that is below the surface. So F fraction would be equal to the, the proportion of volume that's below the surface. So if the object is totally immersed, this fraction is equal to one. And if it's just slightly skimming on the top, there may be like a, you know, a styrofoam ball or something which is very, very close uh, to the top, uh, this fraction would be close to zero. So we can express our equilibrium equation in terms of this fraction because uh, VB will be obviously equal to F times VS, and then uh, the, other, the other one, VA, it's, uh, it's not one step to show this, but you can derive uh, this pretty quickly. Uh, VA is equal to one minus that fraction times the volume of the entire solid. Uh, so if we plug in this uh, fraction below variable into the equation of equilibrium, we would get something like uh, rho f times the fraction plus rho a times 1 minus the fraction equals rho of the solid object. Okay, so from here we could solve for the fraction below. 
even if it had a complicated relationship to the volume. All right. Solve for F, just knowing the densities of the above fluid, below fluid, and solid object that's floating on the surface. Okay, uh, so let's do an example that would use this then. Let's say we have a plastic bead of density uh, 850. That's the solid. A plastic bead of density 850 floats between uh, oil with a density of 800 and water, which has a density of 1,000. And let's ask uh, what fraction is below the surface. All right, so we have a picture here like this. Where we have oil above, water below, the bead floating between, and then some fraction of its volume is below the surface. Uh, so let's plug in and see if we can solve for this fraction f. All right, uh, density of the uh, density of F was the one below, so that's 1,000. Uh, density above was the oil, so 800. And the density of the uh, solid was 850. Okay, so solving this is going to give us, uh, looks like 200F plus 800 equals 850. Double check that, so 800 minus 800F and 1000F gives you 200. All right, so uh, subtracting 800 from both sides gives me a 50 over here, and then 50 over 200 is, uh, we should know that that's equal to one quarter. All right, so one quarter of the volume would be below the surface in the water, and the other three quarters of the volume would be above the surface in the oil. Okay, so that's uh, some of the basics of how fluids behave. We've got the definition of pressure, the use of hydraulics as simple machines, then we've got uh, hydrostatic equilibrium, the variation of pressure with depth. We can apply that to using a manometer as a measurement device or a barometer as a measurement device. And then finally we have the buoyant force for objects immersed in the fluid and the buoyant force for objects uh, in two fluids or at the surface between one fluid and another. All right, so that's our video on the um, basic laws of physics, mechanics, sum of forces applied to fluid systems in a static state.